Oh, not bad. Not bad. You know, a little, a little busy, you know, a couple hiccups here and there, but for the most part, things are okay. Glad to hear it. I am joined by the one and only Dave Lombardo. Thunder Force is out on Netflix tomorrow. Dave, how do you decide what projects you're going to do? Because I would imagine that your phone is busy a, a lot of the time. So how, how, do, how often do offers come in? Like, what's it like being Dave Lombardo drama for hire? Uh, well, it's exciting because I never know what's, what's going to come my way. You know, like like Thunder Force. I mean, this was this came out of left field. Uh, Phil and I have a mutual friend who is another uh, composer for film, and uh, I guess uh, Phil knew that uh, him him and I were were good friends, and he hit him up. So it's it's interesting. It's just um, I, I don't know. I'm very fortunate. And, uh, you know, I have some great friends and, you know, I think I have a pretty good reputation and, uh, you know, yeah. so with that, you know, and I'm easy to work with, you know, I'm not, I'm not difficult and, uh, you know, it seems to all just work out and, and, uh, I don't know. I'm just, uh, I'm very grateful. I love the fact that the last two things I've played from you on my channel are Thunder Force and Satanic. It just show it just shows how never a dull moment in your world there is. Yeah. Oh, Satanic Planet. Wow. Yeah. That's there's some songs on there that are pretty insane. Uh, not you know technically, but very gloomy and dark and evil. You know, <laughs> and of course, you know, the devil seems to follow me around. You know, so <laughs> ever since I was 18 years old, you know, and released. Uh, slayers uh, uh show no mercy you know and uh you know but it, it's exciting and what i like is uh is the challenges i think that's what that is what determines my my choice in in projects it's like okay is is this challenging is this different have i done this before you know yes some of the projects i have you know they're along the same vein but, you know, they all have a different air about them or a different personality about them. And, you know, when I when I see something unique and and uh, interesting, and, you know, I kind of I, I gravitate towards it and and, you know, and I work with them. What's the most unique and interesting thing of recent years? When you say when you say that, because I because because your your pool is so vast, I, I uh, always want to know what's the deepest part of that pool when it comes to. So I, things I, that are outside of, of your usual wheelhouse. Well, Satanic Planet is probably the most, you know, out of the norm uh, of projects that I've done because it didn't require me to play any drums. I was more a part of the programming and, and the production side of it. I took the songs and I was able to create... Uh, you know, movements, musical movements, instead of one just straight linear uh, uh, rhythm or, or, or sound um, or ambience, I was able to create, you know, uh, uh, you know, moods and, and, and just in movements and, and cutting up the parts and, you know, creating more of a, a song rather it just be you know, uh, a barrage of sound. Uh, so that that one to me was the furthest I've stepped out of my my uh, my comfort zone, and I enjoyed it because I've, I've I've been a big fan of of industrial music, and of course, being a drummer, there's no place for a drummer in industrial music when everything's electronic. You know, especially the production side of it. So, uh, you know, this is uh, you know it, it's it's been quite a step away from the norm in the satanic planet album uh we i think i only played drums actual a drum kit on one song out of 10 or 11 and uh so i can't wait to, for that song to to hit the airwaves because it's it's pretty cool um and of course anything that has to do with movies and uh for example i worked with uh tyler bates who introduced me to Phil, uh, 
uh, this uh, project uh, with DC Comics, uh, Dark Knight Death Metal. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that was different as well. But that was, you know, that's me playing actual drums to samples. So, um, you know, it's, uh, I always try to venture away, even though the fans, you know, they just like don't want any part of it. You know, if, it, if it's me playing double bass and playing thrash metal, they love it. Yeah. But any time I step out just a little bit, oh, Dave, you're selling yourself short. You know, I, you know, yeah. oh, this is Slayer. It's like, of course it's not Slayer. You know, I, I'm not going to play this the rest of my life. I'm going to keep venturing out. You know, uh, Mike Patton, I guess, recently did an interview and he said it is a musician's birthright to explore different styles of music and, and like that, you know, and, and it's so true, you know, because if you just stay in your own little world uh, and not venture out, you know, things become a little bit stagnant mm. and you don't, when you come back to what you're known for uh, after venturing off, it becomes fresh again. And then you venture off, that's fresh. And then you come back to the metal and thrash and then it, you know, it, it feels good again because you miss it. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's just about balance, you know? Do you, do you feel like, cause it, it's crazy to me that, even with the projects you've got on the go now, that anyone could want to put you in a box is is, is even... To, like I'm a fan with a microphone, Dave. That's my life. I get to talk to people like you, but on the real. So when that's a fan's viewpoint, I can't understand wanting to keep Dave Lombardo in a box. Do you feel like... Do you feel that outside pressure like in that regards in any way? When... You know, when you put something out and something's new and people haven't heard about it and and and, and you know, it, it's it's just the people online, the trolls, you know, that sometimes get to you. It's a bit annoying. It's like, haven't you heard Dead Cross? Haven't you For heard real. album? Haven't you heard the, what? You know, oh, what's Dave doing? Just drum clinics? I think I read something like that the other day. Wow, he left Slayer to do drum clinics. It's like, no. <laughs> not not by any stretch of the imagination. No, it's just it's just frustrating. But you have to understand that everybody online or everybody in the world now has a voice. And even though they don't make sense, they, they're incoherent at times. Mm. And they, you know, they have a voice and they want to type it out and uh, type out whatever it is that they feel. So um, yeah. You just you just ignore it. You know, Jimi Hendrix said, you know, he doesn't. Uh, there, there's a saying where he says uh, compliments distract him, you know, and, and that is, is great. It, they do distract you from what you like to do and, and and being creative. So the best thing to do is stay off of social media and not pay attention to what anybody says. You know, you just, you know. You just do what you want to do and whatever comes from your heart. And that's, that's, I think, number one. Whatever makes you happy is the direction you need to go. And if I want to play country music or if I want to play fucking, you know, who knows what, yeah. I'm going to do it. Because if it feels good and I'm having a good time, well, who's going to stop me? <laughs> yeah, you know? and, and and it's just it's just a bizarre concept that yeah, like you have your things that you are known for, right? But it doesn't define who you are. No, no, I mean whatever it is that people uh, embrace, the era, the period, the year. Uh, you know, there's some guys that I've 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 spoken to, and they love the Grip Incorporated years, the '90s, where I was you know, experimenting with a more like, uh, you know, it was very rhythmic. Uh, it was metal. It was like thrash at times, you know, but it was a little bit different, a little more melodic or groove rock as they call it. Mm. And, uh, you know, some guys like that, some people like Slayer, some people, you know, now are into Dead Cross. Yeah. And, and what's good about it is that the more different, uh, and abstract projects you do, 
you'll always bring somebody into something that you did maybe several years ago. And they'll say, I didn't know Dave did this album or I didn't know he worked on this. And they'll start, you know, realizing and maybe even, you know, go online and see the amount of records I've done. I think I've recorded now over 40, 40 albums, you know? So um, I'm happy. That's yeah. all that matters. You know, <laughs> I love the fact that you've mentioned Dead Cross a bunch of times. When when that first came to be, was that is that the first? Forgive forgive my ignorance. Is that the first like permanent fixtured band that you and Patton had been in? No, no, we were in Phantomus. Yeah. Of course, Phantomus. Yeah, I knew I was missing one. Like you, you know, know you I... know when you're like I can't fucking remember. Yeah, of course. So when how was that relationship differed? Because I was fucking obsessed with the director's cut. Once upon a time, and Phantomus is different from one record to the next. Let alone when you haven't done a permanent fixtured band for a while. So uh -huh. when you get back together and you start doing that again, how does how does that relationship differ from a project to a project? How is you and Patton in Phantomus different to you and Patton in Dead Cross? Well, in in Phantomus, Patton wrote all the music. He put all that together. That was his baby. He, uh, to me, you know, he didn't need me because all the drums were all programmed and, you know, uh, and, and um, you know, recorded by him in the demos. And then he presented me with the demos and then I had to relearn everything. And I asked him, I said, this sounds great. Why do you need me? He said, because he wanted the human element. He wants, he wants it to feel, he did, didn't want it to feel like it was, programmed or, or anything mm -hmm. like that so um you know and then dead cross all that music when we first uh when Patton first agreed to to join the band uh all the music was written right and, Role yeah. reversal yeah and so all the music was written and then we handed it over to him and then he recorded the vocals and, and there you go uh, and same with the second the recent album we just recorded, but we haven't released yet. Uh, Crane, the guitar player and the bass player, Justin, uh, we we got together first and wrote all the music and then we send it over to Patton. We wrote it and recorded it and then send it over to Patton. So it's a little bit different. And then with Bungle, same thing, you know, now it's the same thing, but it was all written prior. And so they present me with the demos and then I learn it all and give it my spirit. And then uh, then we record it. So uh, you can ask this question when the musical canvas is anything, because Patton can fucking sing anything like, I know. like it, it's fucking wild. But when you have music that sounds like Dead Cross and you've got that canvas written, what makes Patton the guy you call? Was it like this needs something extra schizophrenic here? <laughs> <laughs> you know that that's a good question uh no it wasn't like that it was uh i i remember i i heard the news that the original guitar i mean the original vocalist for dead cross uh couldn't continue you know working in the band because he had uh other responsibilities and commitments which i totally respected and uh, so we were left with an album with no vocalists. It's like, you know, who do we get for something like this? And, uh, you know, so, so Patton came to mind and it was like, well, should I call Patton? You know, I asked the guys, you know, you know, I even asked my wife. It's like, should I say he calls you for projects? Why not? You yeah. know, you guys are good friends. If you're in a bind and you need a vocalist, you know, who knows? Yeah. So, uh, so I, I, I was in New Jersey at the time working with the Misfits, with the original Misfits. And we were rehearsing to do some, uh, some shows. And um, I text him and I was saying, hey, man, you know, I have this new band, Dead Cross, because he actually uh, texted me first and said, uh, hey, if your album needs a home, Ipecac's doors are open for you. You awesome. know, it's like awesome, man. 
you know, so I texted back and I said, hey, we ran into some problems with, with Gabe and uh, would you be interested in singing for Dead Cross? And you know how you, on your iPhone, you could see when somebody's typing. <laughs> the dots. So, yeah. so the little dots are coming up and they disappear. They come up and they disappear again. <laughs> 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 really? Really? Like, like you're watching someone's internal monologue via dots. <laughs> so he, he comes back and says, me? You want me to sing for Dead Cross? I said, yeah, I would love to. He said, yeah, I, I would love to. Yeah, that'd be great. I said, he said, send me the, send me the songs. And, uh, you know, I, I, I spoke to the guys in the band as well. You know, I told them, hey, should I hit up Patton? And everybody was like, yeah, hit him up. So he agreed and uh, you know it was uh i was you know we were lucky and and we did several tours and we have another album waiting to be released uh waiting to wrap up and mix he's obviously been busy with tomahawk and we were busy with mr bungle so i think now we're about to uh i'm sure he'll he'll wrap up the dead cross album fairly soon and like is it are we talking uh a different approach on this dead cross record because with the people involved the only thing i expect is the unexpected um it's uh the approach to yeah. the record was the same well that first album was a freak of nature that that you know that album came together so organically like at the right time I was at the right place at the right time. Uh, the situation that was happening with another band I was with at the time fell apart and just opened the doors for me to just, you know, create Dead Cross, join Suicidal, join the Misfits. It just all snowballed in 2016. So, uh, so that album came together a little different. We didn't have much time as a band and we didn't tour much as a band at that time. We were just barely getting to know each other. And my sole focus was to create the most brutal album ever in retaliation of everything that was going on in the world, including, you know, like uh, there were bombings and, and uh, you know, killings in clubs at the Bataclan in France. Yeah, yeah. So that fueled me because all this uh, terrorism was hitting close to home, which to me, I find venues and stages, those yeah. are my way from home, you yeah. know? So, uh, so, you know, terrorism was hitting at the wrong place and really fueling my anger. And so this album, we had a little more time to work together I was, you know, commuting to downtown Los Angeles and meeting up with Crane. And we were taking our time, you know, trying to create something a little bit more, uh, 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 just a little different. Not much. It's still going to be hard and, and fast and, and everything, but it, there's a little bit more to it. Uh, that last album, the first album was uh, about 28, 29 minutes. Uh, I think this album is going to be a little longer. So the right. song a little bit, you know, a little more. What anger fueled this record? Mm. Or did anger fuel this record? Uh, anger fuels everything in my life. <laughs> you know, yes. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this feels good that I'm angry, you know. But Love uh, it. yeah, you know, I, I, I can't think of anything specific. But what I did notice was whatever happened in 2016 in the creation of the first Dead Cross album actually was like, okay, a template for the next one. You know, the songs are a little longer, but it created like, okay, this is Dead Cross. And we had time to work with each other and hang out with each other, go on tour. And uh, so we had a better understanding of each other's capabilities and approach to music. 
and like it feels like you built a real foundation because that's important like while it's a project that you put together when it was the first record like it's more of a band this time oh yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. we <laughs> we spent like six weeks on tour and uh you know on a bus traveling around europe going from eastern europe furthest eastern as we can go in europe all the way to the west and back to the east go up to the north go down to the south we zag zigzagged all across the europe and uh it was uh it was a lot of fun we we had a great time i have to ask about the band dynamic because you're now in the fucking misfits and that blows my mind right <laughs> like i mean it blows my mind that the misfits are a band in the realm that it is i'd waited my fucking whole life to see it i was in vegas for that first run I, like oh. i couldn't i couldn't travel to chicago because i was uh. in the middle of moving here to the states oh, so, I had okay. to, so i had to miss that but the first run i went to vegas and to your enormous credit dave i i hadn't thought about what the misfits would sonically sound like in the modern era what was rehearsals like going in for the first time with those people, that situation, and that back catalogue? That's a wild afternoon, my friend. It was. It was. It was. Uh, it was surreal because you you hear about you know you you know the history of the band and uh, you know everything that Jerry and Glenn have gone through. And uh, and then meeting Jerry, for, I've, I've known Glenn since, you know, Glenn released his first album under Danzig. You know, we've toured Same together. label, right, at that time. Right. Yeah. And Rick Ruby, yeah, we were, we yeah. were label mates. And uh, so I've known him for years. And, you know, he's always been kind to me. He's been, you know, a, a, a great, you know, a, a friend, acquaintance. And he called me one day, just out of the blue. Somebody sent me a message. Hey, Danzig wants to call you. Uh, is it cool if I give him your number? I said, yeah, of course. He should have it, you know? It's like, uh, he calls me up just out of the blue and, and says, Dave, uh, you know, uh, look, the misfits are getting back together. And, uh, you know, I, and he said, that he was not going to uh, uh, get the band together unless he chooses the drummer. And he wanted me to be the drummer. And I was honored. And uh, he, he just he just said, I, I want you as 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 the guy, you know, behind me. And uh, I said, great. Well, I'm here. I'm ready to go. You know, he said he, he would put me in touch with Jerry. They sent me a list of songs, which was like probably 30 songs. <laughs> yeah. You know, and they're all under two minutes. Yeah. Half minutes. And uh, and I had to sit there and make my notes, learn these songs. And, you know, it was difficult to transcribe because of the recordings. And you really didn't know what they were doing. So I had to really do a lot of uh, homework and and you know, watch a lot of YouTube videos to see what, what was being played in certain sections because it was inaudible. You yeah. couldn't, and couldn't that, figure. even the footage that you're talking about watching is like fucking grainy VCR from the early 80s. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? So just turn down the volume and watch the drummer and then you can see <laughs> what doing. Right, got it. So uh, I was able to, you know, put all that, uh, put all that together and, I went to New Jersey, hung out with Jerry only, stayed at his house and, you know, got a, you know, a, a really good idea of who this band really was. And, you know, got to pick Jerry's brain and the history and, you know, his, his, uh, his, his stories with the Sex Pistols and Black Flag. And, you know, it was just so beautiful to hear all this history and, uh, you know, and then the first rehearsals happened, you know, I think it was, I think we only had two or three rehearsals before the first show, but Jerry and Doyle and I and AC, uh, the guitar player, yeah. the, uh, stage right, 
you know, we had a lot of time to go through the details and, and, and all the parts in the song. So it was, it was phenomenal. It was great. And like, uh, looking forward to the future. Mate, I tell you, I don't fucking, I didn't pay, I'm a man with a crimson skull tattoo on the side of my neck, right? <laughs> like, but I, ha I hadn't contemplated how fucking metal it would sound. Like, I was impressed by the the guitar tone and everything was so thick textured and it sounds so hard. But to, to like I say to your credit earlier, I wasn't ready for the Lombardo factor on Misfits material because you've got your fucking... Your, your, there is a style that you can tell with certain drummers. And yeah, I wasn't... Yeah. I wasn't in. I wasn't ready for all of that coming together. It's a fucking. It's a harder package than people would <laughs> than people would expect, especially yeah. when you open with twenty eyes, you savages. Oh no no! <laughs> death comes ripping. Death comes ripping. Sorry, yes, death comes ripping. Yes. That intro, you know, and and you see, here we are again. You know, going back to the beginning of our conversation, you know, with the with the trolls, them saying, "Oh, you're you know." you know, there's too much talent for the band. You know what? That's, that to me is not true. Those songs required, uh, uh, first of all, you need to learn the songs to a point where Glenn calls them out. Oh, you know what? What are we going to do right now? Let's see. Uh, let's do 20 eyes. You have to know that intro. You have to know the count, you know, there, there are 30 plus songs or, or you know, either 26 to 32 songs. I think we played on stage and Glenn calls them out. You got to know them. And there's a lot of them that sound similar. Mm. So to just, you know, to just say, Hey, you know, uh, um, you know, there's too much talent, too much drummer there for the band. That's not true. You really need to be, you know, on point and be professional and know your shit and memorize those songs. Uh, uh, there can't be any kind of mistake. You know, they, yeah. I would be, I would feel terrible to ever pull any kind of mistake on stage, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in any band, you know, it's just something you don't, you don't do as at least for me, I, I don't, I don't believe in that. I like the juxtaposition as well, though, of like super professional and no mistakes were in the pocket versus the rehearsal room fuckery of just like, no, nah, we're going to play this song and I don't care that 30,000 people are waiting. I love that shit. It, it, keeps yeah. the, it keeps the punk rock within something that is like I saw the Misfits in a fucking stadium in Los Angeles. That still doesn't feel like I it's know. still crazy to me, but the the fact that the punk rock still exists on that stage, I love it, man. Yeah, it does, it, and it's uh, it's raw, it's brutal. There's no metronome, there's no click track. I'm not, I don't have in ears to anything following me. No, that's just pure heart and tempo. And uh, what I loved about those shows was the 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 enthusiasm or, or at least the crowd singing along to this music and it was a, more like a instead of a, a, it being like a rock concert which it was but it was more of a celebration the the attitude Completely. that the people was Completely. a celebration yeah 100 and everybody knew the words everybody yep. You every single word and, and no phones, I, Dave. So everyone was in the fucking moment. That golden circle in Vegas, like it felt so weird not being there with my phone, and I did. I hated it. And then the fucking show started, and we were all in it together, and people were fucking crying, and it was all these people that had waited their whole lives for it. It was special. Yeah, yeah it was. It, it's beautiful. It's yeah. great when it's special like that. Uh, so, Mr. Bungle as well, fucking just. Crazy band after crazy band. Fuck it, let's throw them out. So, but Bungle, again, it could have gone anywhere with that material. But yeah. with it being back, like back to that early thrash aesthetic and a demo and the rest of it, did you expect, because I was, even as someone that's a fan, I, I was blown away by 
the fact that those shows sold out in fucking seconds and were going for hundreds of dollars instantly. Like, it was wild. Getting a bungle ticket was chaos. Like, it was. What, did, did, you, did you have any idea, especially when you are making music that is, even by bungle standards, that obtuse and that confrontational? Like, what's the expectations on something like that? Because on the one side, it's fucking Patton and Ian and Lombardo and fucking, yeah. And on the flip side, and that back catalogue. And on the flip side, the music is like... Just so in your face and uh, like those it being really successful and being really confrontational is what it's all about to me. But like, what's yeah. it like being in that bubble before you step out as the new Mr. Bu- the, what well, the new old Mr. Bungle? Like, it is the new Mr. Bungle. I spoke to Scott about this. Yeah, yeah it is the new Mr. Bungle. I mean, it's, um, you know, it puts you in a, there's so much, you see what, what a lot of people I think don't understand is that there's a lot of uh, time uh, with between you and listening to the demos. So I had a lot of time to sit down with the demos and decipher what's what's being played um, and and what they wanted in the certain sections. Um, so there was a lot of homework that I had to do before stepping into a rehearsal room. Uh, so I, I sat with the music and, and I rehearsed, you know, on my drums and, uh, you know, for probably several weeks, you know, three weeks or four weeks before that, before we went and, and started rehearsing. I think before the first show, I think we had about five or six days of rehearsal. Right. Get those songs down. And, uh, you know, it's nerve wracking, you know, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, focused it's like I are the tiger you know I'm like there you know I, I have my notes I'm flipping through notes while I'm on stage you know until you get the songs down you know uh yeah. you know confidently yeah you Scott know, was I, saying Scott was saying the same thing about learning was just like his right hand the day after that he first started playing it was like fuck the day after exactly you know, and, and it's it's the same thing for a drummer. You know, it's like, how the hell am I going to play that? You know, you mm. keep thinking to yourself. But as time progresses and you're getting more comfortable with the music, you know, then, you know, uh, uh, it all falls into place. And then once you play together with the band, there's like a sense of relief. It's like, okay, there's really not that much stress because everybody is going through the same thing that I was going through, mm. you know, uh, doubt hey, what's the count here? I can't figure it out. You know, and everybody's patient and helps you out. And so, you know, although the nerves are quite high during your homework period, once you go into the rehearsal room, it, it kind of like eases and everybody's on the same plane. Everybody's concerned and everybody just wants to do the best show possible. Is Bungle a thrash band now, or is Bungle whatever the fuck it wants to be? Because it's easy for perception to be like, well, he's added Scott Ian and Dave Lombardo, and they've just made a thrash EP, so I guess Bungle a thrash now. But I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't buy it. <laughs> you know, they, you know, like, you know, like, like as individual musicians, we are. They are whatever they want to be at the moment. You know, if it's a, you know, a a smooth jazz kind of bungle, then it'll be a smooth jazz kind of band, you know, any, and and if they want to be a thrash band, they could be that. If they want to be rock and roll, they'll be that blues, whatever they want to do. And that's the beauty of being a musician, artist, and have an open mind is that you could, you're like a chameleon. You could just... Uh, morph into something and 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 then you know pull yourself away and go into another direction and um, you know I learned that a long time ago probably in the late 90s when I first met Pat because I always felt like I had a diverse uh, vein in my body you know musically I wasn't just mm-hmm. met and Pat really made me feel that you could do whatever you want man just do whatever you want. And at that point, I started taking on other projects that were 
little bit different, you know, out of left field, you know, mixing a, a or an orchestral uh, uh, ensemble with my drumming, like I did on Vivaldi, The Meeting, um, that album I did in 99. So I was, I was working with, with string and, and chamber instruments, you know, way back then. And uh, I have to attribute that, you know, direction and that, uh, that approval of going into those directions, you know, uh, to Patton and, uh, and John Zorn, which is, uh, you know, the producer for the first Bungle record. Yeah. Do, do you think that uh, outside perception is, is, is fascinating? Because I, I quite like hearing the, the semi-vulnerability of you going, well, I wanted to do other shit and I knew I wanted to do other shit, but like it took someone going, you should do other shit to, to kick that in. Do you think that sometimes people, like we're almost guilty of thinking you're like fucking Avengers or something? Do you know what I mean? When, when we like so much of your shit, like it just think that it just, it comes natural when in reality, every one of those people has struggle or work that goes into that particular thing. Do you think that sometimes like people would be surprised to hear that you're human in that way as a musician? Uh, I think it would surprise people. They pigeonhole you. It's unfortunate, you know, they fall in love with a certain period, a certain body of work in your life, and they'll never allow you to venture off. And, and you know, I think that I, I really don't know what that is. And, but I don't have the guts to tell, let's say, let's say one of my favorite, uh, you know, um, I, I can't think of an artist now. Let's say, you know, let's say Zeppelin. Right. Let, I, 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 I love Zeppelin or, you know, or Jimi Hendrix, you know, like classic, you know, uh, early rock. And uh, imagine me telling him, you know what, I like this album, but you know what, I, I don't like this new stuff, man. You know, you really lost me, bro. <laughs> yeah, me telling me, you know, I'm not comparing, making myself like those guys, but, you know, if you admire an artist, you should admire the where they're going as musicians yeah you know, and if you don't like something you know then stick to what you originally you know enjoyed you know but you know to go off on them online because you're not happy with the direction that you know that they're going in that moment doesn't mean it's going to be forever you know it's yeah. just the moment you know absolutely yeah. and it's like fucking you might not like an ingredient that goes into a cake, but you might still like the cake. All right, you might not like this thing, but that yeah. is part of what makes you like this other thing. It all, it all exactly. entwines. It all entwines. Yeah, you know, and if let's say, for example, that that rhythm or that beat in that one album that you liked, and you don't like anything else I've done except that album, that beat that stems from a blues beat. You know, yeah. little they know that came from a, a Latin jazz beat. Did you know that that rhythm came from a Latin jazz beat? No. Well, if I was just narrow minded and didn't, you know, explore any other styles of music, you know, maybe I wouldn't have come up with something like that, that you enjoyed so much, you know. So it's you can never win. But is there anything left you haven't done as far as a style is concerned? Yeah, a lot. What what There's comes to mind? Like just something. If if you could have any project in terms of a style land on your desk tomorrow, um, man, I I, I don't know. I, I I can't think off the top of my head. You know, the only the only thing I could think of is something totally opposite of thrash. Yeah, and it would be maybe some really slow blues or something. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe something that I do, maybe a, a, a drum rhythm or, or, or a band where I can only use brushes and mallets. Nice. Yeah. You know? And uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. You know, nothing in particular. I mean, I can't think of a band or anything like that. But yeah. You know, this is just something that's challenging. 
you know, maybe, maybe something with hand percussion, you know, maybe a band where I play bongos throughout the entire set. You well, know? Fuck, well, we've got, well, we've got satanic planet with the industrial approach. So why the fuck not, man? Yeah. Like, yeah. I guess even when I think, when I thought of that, it's interesting that when we spoke about the musical canvas, it was the industrial side. To me, it's the pacing. The, the, the only the song that we've heard so far it has a sort of a, a, gr a more grinding pacing. Yeah. Like, is it is it fun to, to step out into that before I start talking to you about drums themselves? Um, yes. What do you mean pacing? Uh, the tempo? Yes. Yeah. Like that oh. sludgy, grimy, grinding fashion is yeah. as far away from Show No Mercy as it's possible to be, yeah. right? Yeah, that, I, I enjoy that. You know, like the Melvins, you know, Dale Crover uh, working with, we did something Phantomous Melvins Big Band several years ago. Yeah. Years, many years ago now. And, uh, you know, stud, watching and studying Dale, I really got into this slow, real heavy doom, you know, style of music that I really wasn't aware of prior, you know, and, um, you know, seeing how he played and, and studying him, I think really helped me and, and honing in uh, my ability to play those very slow, grudgy, you know, tempos. And um, I, I enjoy it. And, and still to this day, you know, uh, I'll apply some of that, you know, in, in what I do today mm. in everything I do. So it, it, like, it's good to venture off and try new things because you're then just adding more ingredients to your, to your style. And it makes your, your ability to adapt to different bands and different grooves so much easier. Mm. Yeah. When, when you talk about your style, um, something that I, I think is fascinating is it's so hard to be an iconic drummer because a guitar tone is so instantly recognisable and a voice style is so instantly recognisable. And I feel like you have to have, in the main, at least a loose idea of drums in general to truly understand that with a drummer. But then there are, there are some people that write iconic drum parts right mm -hmm. the the fucking the double bass part in angel of death the fucking snare riff on sad but true like those moments what makes a, a drum riff iconic because it's it's so difficult to do and it's so it's it they're so few and far between those like um those well, moments it needs uh, an iconic song behind it. You could have gotcha. some drum parts, you know, but if you don't have that song to support it, uh, you know, then it just becomes another, another, you know, another sound, another, another rhythm. Um, you know, I, I think the big part definitely is the band and the musician and the time, the time, that that piece of music came out or, right. you know, was released. Um, you know, some people, you know, like more the, uh, you know, the, the, the Slayer style when I wasn't in the band, you know, and, but then some people like the other, but it's just, when did you discover the band? If they discovered it during, you know, let's say Diabolus or, yeah. Uh, you know, and I wasn't in the band, of course you're going to prefer those albums because those are the ones that touched your heart, you know? Uh, and so, you know, I, I think it has, a, uh, there's a lot of uh, ingredients, a lot of things that, you know, make up uh, a, a, a drum, a drum part, you know, for it to be iconic. I, I yeah. think it, where you heard it, how you felt, if it moved you and, and everything. And, 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 and the musicians in, in the song. Do you ever know? Because there's times, like, I've, I'm close to fucking shit tons of musicians. And there's times where they're like, 
yeah, we knew with that one. And there's other times where they've done something that they're so fucking surefire certain of and it doesn't land with people. Have there, have there ever been many that come to mind in that bracket for you? Things that, things that you've, like the time, the place, that has all felt right. And then when it released, it, you still look back and go, I'm not, like that, that surprised me. Um, when, when something like that happens, it usually starts with a chill. <laughs> you get the chills when you listen to something and it gives you the goosebumps, you know, you're like, Whoa, this is, this is good. You know, I feel like I'm elevating because um, the music making you high. Yeah. You know, um, that, that is a special moment, but you can't, if it makes you feel good, you can't worry about what other people think or feel because chances are they're not going to feel the same as you do. So what matters when you're writing music is like, do you like it? Does it feel good to you? And, and you're going to be your hardest uh, critique. You know, you're going to critique yourself the hardest. Uh, um, so I feel that if it feels good to you and it gives you that, that the goosebumps when you when you listen back to it you know that should be the stamp of approval you know you can't really worry about because you're, you're not going to please everybody you know yeah. like we said earlier you just yeah you know they're going to say oh i like your other work even though this is like to you you feel like it's the best you've done you know you you know you can't worry about that you really can't and i i think that has been my mantra where i don't care what yeah. what people say do i like it do i want that body of work attached to my name do i want to be a part of this band and attach my name to this band does this feel good and if you get yes all the way down then you're golden you I know love that. you're happy you know I, I love that because i because i have to interview so many bands of different ages and different eras and different times and all the rest of it and i feel like something this is something that i scream from the rooftops as loud as loudly as i can as often as i can and that's that i feel like sometimes in the modern era where feedback is so constant and so instant i feel like bands have almost got cold feet about the bands that i see at the top of festivals not second not even like sub headliners not second stage headliners the bands that headline are bands that were completely out of whack with their time completely fucking yeah. one-offs that didn't give a shit about trends that rip through with something different. And I like hearing you say, as long as I am happy with the work that I have done, that is all I need. Because I feel like that's how music succeeds when it's pure in that way. And it's not about writing for an algorithm or a fan base or an anything. Like, yeah. is, that, is that a fair take? That is a fair take because if the internet existed back when Slayer released their very first album, you know, we would have been destroyed. Yeah. We would have been like, oh, what is this? You know, what or, or you South of Heaven being as fucking weird as it is after after Rain in Blood, people would be like, eh? Yeah, yeah. So so today, these days you have to go with the approach of how we did it back then. We didn't care. We thought it was heavy. We thought it was brutal and evil. It was dark. It had a certain feel to it and it made all of us happy. It had our stamp of approval. So what we were listening to at the time uh, created a, a bar. It's like, okay, we got to come up with something like this or better. And we always wanted to do something better and, and different. So. I, I think really, you know, musicians and bands, listen, listen to yourselves, man. Don't listen to anyone. Oh, you know, in a class, another thing is like bands that feel, uh, oh no, that's our fans won't go for that because our fans only like us to do this style. Well, then there was no growth. You're gonna stagnate. You're gonna grow stagnant. It's just not gonna evolve if you don't venture out and try new things, you know? Mm. So, um, you know, I, I feel like part of longevity is being as 
you know, creative as you can be. Like, like for example, when Slayer released Rain and Blood, what was, we did the exact opposite on South of Heaven. Yeah. It, it was a little bit slower, although there yeah. were fast songs. Yeah. But we touched on slower rhythms, slower, you know. More off kilter shit. We shifted things and the sound yeah. was a little bit different as well. Yeah. So then Seasons came out and it was different. So, you know, you, you have to do that, man. Otherwise, you know, I don't know. Maybe it works for some bands, but for yeah. me, I think, you know, personally, it, it feels good when you when you try different uh, uh, different styles, different, uh, you know, approaches to music. I agree, mate. I agree. So final question. Um, has, has there been anything that you like? I won't ask you specifics, obviously, because it hasn't been announced for a reason. Is there anything that you've worked on during lockdown that we don't know about yet? Yes. Can I talk about it? Yeah, talk by all means. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, that's good enough. That's good enough to leave the intrigue to me, man. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, well, you already know about Satanic Planet. That album yep. is going to come out. And there's two other projects that I'm working on right now that I have deadlines on. I have to get them both out by May 15th. So I am just, I'm in my home studio. I'm locked in here. I have nowhere to go, you know, pandemic. So, uh, so I've been, you know, sitting behind a computer and a drum set and, and working on the, and learning new music just constantly. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of coming up, especially this new movie. Yes, absolutely. Thunder so I, 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 like we've done the force as well with Scott. Was that was it a blast to work on as well? Because like we had Phil, the composer, on just before you. It it felt like a real a fun thing. He got the chance to put together his fucking metal supergroup, which was wild. But it must be satisfying getting to just fucking like fucking blow out on a project like this with your mates. Yes, I. Uh, um, yeah, Phil, uh, uh, Phil and I, we have a mutual friend, Tyler, and, and I think, you know, he introduced, uh, uh, Tyler introduced us, uh, and, uh, and when Phil told me about this, I was like, I know exactly what you want to do. Cause I've kind of dabbled with, uh, working with, uh, I did a, I did a show with like a 60 piece orchestra, uh, for Christopher Young composer for Hellraiser. And, yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street and, you know, a lot of other horror movies. And um, so I knew the direction he wanted to do, he wanted to go and, and, and what he expected from me. Uh, but I, I didn't know at what level this was, you know, and then they said Melissa McCarthy and Octavia Spencer, Jason Bateman. It's like, wait, these are big names, you know, and and uh, Netflix is involved. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is going to be a lot of fun, you know? So, uh, you know, I received, you know, from Phil uh, the, the music stems to, to, to what I needed to learn. And, and it, it just, it was, it was a lot of fun. It's just one of those projects where you're challenged because you see these little movements, these little snippets of music, you know, they range from 15 seconds, 30 seconds, you know, maybe even a minute, but that's it. That's the most, uh, except for the, you know, except for the song that uh, Lizzie and Corey and uh, were a part of, mm. uh, you know, so these little movements, you know, you play for two and a half bars and you have to, stop playing on a downbeat or, or an upbeat so you, weird da, 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 da. and that's it <laughs> oh, this, like, whoa. but also because i worked with phantomus i had that experience in, yeah. in those songs so it's very similar and um you know with that experience really helped me you know uh through my career in working with composers and and uh, and other styles of music that would be very challenging, you know, for or difficult for other musicians that never dabbled in this in this realm. 
And from an outside perspective, it's fucking great to see Netflix back in heavy music as well. If they've got a big movie with fucking Melissa McCarthy in it uh, and it's backed by you guys, that's a fucking great thing for us all. Dave Lombardo, I doubtlessly will be talking to you again with all these myriad of projects that you've got <laughs> coming up. So enjoy yourself and I hope you meet your deadlines and I'll catch you soon. Thank you. Take care, man. Thanks Cheers, for Cheers, Dave. Chat. All the best, man. See ya. Dave Lombardo. There you go, everybody. Awesome.